في لقاء جديد من ضمن النشاط الذي تعقده مؤسسه دراسات البيئه النوديه وتاسسها دكتورنا محمد الاسد بالتعاون مع مؤسسه اغا خان للثقافه ودار الفنون مؤسسه الفنون شمال في دعوه كبار معماري العالم والعالم العربي فنستهل برنامج معماري العالم العربي البروفيسور هو صليبه وهو غني عن التعريف ومن لا يعرفه فبصوره البروفيسور هو صليبه هو مخطط مدن ومخاطر وواحد في المركز المشترك للتصميم الخضري في جامعه اوكسفورد بروكس البريطانيه وقد قام هو صليبه بالتدريس في الجامعه الامريكيه في بيروت والجامعة اللبنانية وجامعة التدريس يوسف وعمل مستشارا للتخطيط مع البنك الدولي في في مجموعة دراسات عن لبنان وعمل أيضا مخططا للمدن في مؤسسة تنمية المجتمع التابعة لمدينة لوس أنجلوس الأمريكية وكتب العديد من المقالات عن العمارة والتخطيط في لبنان وهو مؤلف كتاب بيروت 1920 1940 والعمارة السكنية بين التراث والحداثة بيروت 1998 بالانجليزية فندعوكم جميعا بتقديم البروفيسور ومن صغير. First I would like to apologize I'm not very well prepared for this presentation so you have to bear with me. My problem was that I had a lot of information it's now for 15 years that I was immersed in the problem of, of Beus reconstruction and uh, actually my biggest problem was what not to include uh, as much as what to include in this particular presentation. In the same time another problem is so much has been written on Beus reconstruction uh, so actually it's, uh, it starts to be a little bit difficult to find a particular angle to read the city and to give an additional input, an original point of view on the city. So uh, what I have decided to do at first is to trace but what I have decided to do first is to trace the evolution of the city between of the reconstruction between 1990 and 2000. And uh, I found out that Beirut 2000 has changed, but did not change enough. And how far can I explain this particular change? Uh, I will start by my introduction then, uh, okay, I will, I will go about the presentation. But please bear with me in terms of coordination between the visual material and the text. Uh, people in the audience who are expecting to uh, a controversial talk about the reconstruction of Beirut Central District uh, will be disappointed. Uh, the type of controversy is gone. It has moved from the center to the periphery. Beirut, outside its center, is evolving into uh, Beirut 2000. Uh, outside of the center, is always evolving to one of the most congested, densified, chaotic, and expensive city in the region. We are starting to look back on the paralyzed, half-raised, half slowly evolving city center as the only grace, the only open space in the city to escape to. It's no more an island of exclusion as it used to be referred to in the past by the critics. On the other hand, a decade does not give enough distance to issue a balanced assessment of the medium and long-term impact of reconstruction. Until recently, the debate still wavered between a progressive promotional approach centered around the private sector and a conservative culturalist approach centered around the public sector intervention. We try both, actually, but we don't have enough distance to come up with clear conclusions. However, a new phenomenon is evolving beyond the 
political and intellectual debate of the past 10 years. On one hand, the center is being taken over by the inhabitants themselves of the city. On the other hand, attention has moved to the evolution of Beirut outside its center because, like a recent article of Le Monde, uh, Beirut is evolving not only in terms of the reconstruction of its center, Beirut is highly interesting outside the center. Uh, we don't have enough time to uh, tackle both uh, the center of Beirut and outside Beirut, the periphery of, of the center. Tomorrow I'll be talking about that in a closed seminar. Today I will just uh, tackle two, three, uh, three uh, main issues. The first is, I would like to place Beirut Central District reconstruction in its larger context, in its national context. Uh, second, I would like to point, point out to the dialectics initiated by the reconstruction. Then I would like to concentrate on one particular issue, is the issue between modernization and uh, conservation. And because this particular perspective on the problem will give us a lot of explanation on the controversy that's going on now. So, more or less, this is how, how I would like to frame uh, this, uh, this presentation. First, the public uh, usually uh, uh, reduce Lebanon's post-war reconstruction to Beirut's reconstruction. And Beirut's reconstruction to one uh, to the central district reconstruction and the whole reconstruction project to one person, Rafiq Halim. In order to have a more comprehensive view of Beirut's reconstruction for the past 10 years, it shall be placed within the framework of the National Recovery Plan and the recent history, historical perspective and the pre-war and war and post-war periods. Uh, what, you will, what you see in this, in this particular table is first the outcome of the war, it's, it's clear, then uh, the, its impact on the physical and social infrastructure, then uh, uh, its impact on the, on the, also on the economic uh, uh, the conditions of, of, of the country between 1982 and 1990. And here uh, you see also the recovery scenario, uh, which was planned between 1995 and 2007. And actually it was centered around one particular issue, $60 billion uh, are needed to generate a, a GDP growth of 6 to 8 uh, percent to raise per capita income per annum, per annum to its 1974 level. So it's, it's, it's a harsh, economic pro uh, program. And the recovery plan itself, also between 1995 and 2007, uh, it needs three main points, the macroeconomic adjustment policy to stabilize domestic currency, to a reconstruction plan for the economic, physical, and social infrastructure for 13 years to stimulate the efficiency of the private sector, and we establish Beirut as the focal point for business in the Middle East. Third, a comprehensive administrative reform. As you see in this recovery plan, Beirut plays is one part of the whole issue of reconstruction. However, due to its political and economic uh, role, uh, it tended to take the active, actually to accommodate the whole attention of, of the reconstruction. And for this reason, I would like today just to concentrate on this particular issue of Beirut's reconstruction itself. But tomorrow I will tackle the, the periphery and also the national reconstruction plan in, in another seminar. Uh, okay, uh, the main issue I'd like to address is the dialectics of conservation. And uh, this is one of the most uh, delicate issues uh, that were controversial for the past 10 years. And uh, this particular issue has three levels uh, we have to deal with. The, the first, we have to deal with the historical aspects. 
What are the features to preserve in the central business district and why? The second, what is the level of preservation? Third, what is the quality of preservation that we have to follow? Then, what is the approach uh, and uh, the implementation process? Uh, I will start first by placing Beirut in its historical context. Beirut is uh, just, you know, very briefly, I don't want to give another presentation about uh, Beirut's evolution. Beirut is 5,000 5, years old and has two layers of history. First, the underground archaeology, then we have the, the above-ground remaining townscapes. Beirut was only important, an important city at two stages of its history. First, during the Roman period, when it was a Roman colony of the highest dignity with the famous uh, school of law. Second, 19th century later, uh, when it became the gateway city of the Levant and the port of Damascus under European pressure. Okay. Beirut intramurals, in between this, uh, uh, during the medieval period, Beirut occupied a small space, as you see over here, and it was a secondary city compared to Saida or to Tripoli, who were actually the, uh, who played the role of the port cities of Damascus. So Beirut only acquired its importance during the 19th century. In modern times, uh, starting uh, during the 19th century, Beirut passed through two phases of modernization. The first phase, The first phase was initiated by the Egyptians in the 1830s and it was carried on by the Ottomans according to European models in the 1870s. We, okay. we will refer to this first phase of modernization by the Ottomans as second-hand modernization because it, it was done according to European models, but at the same time it was done through via Istanbul. Uh, and it was completed in the 1930s and 40s, first hand, by, uh, by the French mandate. Okay, as you can see here, you can see a superimposition of the medieval fa fabric in red, and Place de l'Etoile, which is a Osmanian planning, an Osmanian Bozart planning, superimposed on the medieval fabric of, of Intramuros Beirut. And here you have to, I have to point out to, 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 a, to an important uh, uh, issue. Why colonial, Beirut, uh, colonial planning in, in North Africa, for instance, used to create dual cities. We used to have the Medina on one side and the modern city on the other side. Beirut is one of the rare cities where colonialism superimposed the colonial city, the colonial imprint of the city on the medieval city itself. So, for this, for this reason, when we have tourists coming to Lebanon, we rarely uh, visit Beirut, because Beirut, actually the history of Beirut, the landscape of Beirut, as we see it now, it's a colonial landscape. So we usually we go to Tripoli or to Saida in order to show the, uh, a uh, the evolution of the city from its medieval core to its modern extension, which is not the case of Beirut. And this is important why, because I'll come back to it okay, later on. It's an issue of history here that most of the time uh, reconstruction, the efforts of reconstruction were criticized of wiping out the memory of the city, but most of the time we don't know what is really the memory of the city. We have to investigate historically to see what we are wiping out and if we are really wiping it out or not. And this is uh, an issue that I would like to come back later to. So what, what I would like to say is that pre-war Beirut was a modern city already with very little traces of its medieval past. 
Okay? So, uh, <coughs> uh, the second way of modernization, because history repeats itself, the second wave of modernization came one century later, and uh, it's actually under uh, okay, it's the Hadith Solidar Beirut. And here I would like to uh, to make a, a parallel between two periods of modernization. Forever modernizing. Okay, so we have um, uh, uh, Abdul Hamid uh, Beirut. Then one, 100 years later, we have Hariri Beirut. And what? Uh, actually, it's not simply uh, an issue of, of doing a uh, just an interesting parallel. It's, uh, it's what's very interesting is for people who were doing research on the, on, on the 1900 modernization of Beirut. They found out that the same controversy about wiping out the, the medieval fabric of the city by the Ottomans and by the French were met by the same controversy that 100 years later that faced Solidaire at this point. So it's, it's, it's very clear that Beirut, uh, that the reconstruction of Beirut and the controversy is repeating itself. Okay, just a, you know, between the turn of the 20th century and the turn of the 21st century. And uh, in both cases, the modernizing of Beirut was tied to uh, individual rulers and strong figures who had a political program. First, we have a sultan with a traditional power base, then we have an entrepreneur with a self made financial power base at 100 years of difference. But their programs are the same. Both of them are future oriented. And both of them, that they are dealing with the globalization of the economy. Because when now we are dealing, most of the time we say that we are dealing with the issue of globalization. Beirut was global 100 years ago already. It was dealing with, it, it went into the international economy 100 years ago. Now it's a second phase of globalization. So uh, all what I'm trying to say is the problem of reconstruction and the controversy of reconstruction that we have now for the central business circuit is not something new. That it's something that happened at two stages in the modern history of Beirut. Okay? And this actually what differentiates Beirut from other capitals in the region. Okay, because Beirut is no more a dual city as much as a city where different layers were superimposed over uh, each other. So, and here I would like to come back to, uh, to Francois Chouet, what she said about the, the issues of uh, conservation and reconstruction. And she said that they were always tied à la tradition de destruction constructive. They, you know, they were always tied to the tradition of uh, destructive construction. Okay, and she said also it was always tied to a volonté politique de modernisation, which is the the uh, political will to modernize. So always reconstruction was tied to to uh, I mean uh, uh, this uh, uh, destructive uh, uh, destruction constructive and uh, volonté politique de modernisation. And okay, the economic will to access the world economy, and the personal will of the rulers themselves to access history. So, so it's not something new. History is repeating itself. Uh, okay. Also, I would like to point out to to another uh, uh, issue that 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 was repeated historically. Uh, please. Here we see that uh, um, Beirut uh, 1920, the start of the French mandate, and Beirut was destroyed inside, okay, and the debris was taken 
from the destruction of Beirut intramuros in order to reshape its waterfront. Okay? Now, next. Uh, so, all this part actually was wiped out and the debris was taken to reshape the, the, uh, the waterfront. 100 years later, okay, the same thing, Beirut was wiped out and the debris was taken to gain also to reshape the waterfront. Next. Next. Here we have and next. And this is what we'll be getting. Okay? So it's the same process that's being repeated uh, for uh, the reconstruction of the period. Okay. So the issue here is no more to ask should we preserve historic Beirut? It's, the question is, is early modern Beirut worth preserving? And here, I, I would like to be very clear about it. Since medieval Beirut does not exist, it did not exist prior to the war. Okay. What existed actually is late Ottoman and French mandate Beirut. Okay. So, the issue here is not if we want to preserve historic Beirut. I mean, for us, it depends how, how do we define historic Beirut. Most of us, historic Beirut is medieval Beirut. It's Beirut that before, before the colonial period. Beirut before the colonial period disappeared already at the turn of the century. So actually what we are dealing with the question is early, is colonial Beirut worth preserving in our conception of what we did, in our conception of modern heritage? Do we accept colonialism? as part of our heritage. Actually, uh, what, what is left from the townscapes of Beirut after the war is the French mandate. We have nothing else. We have, of course, underneath the archaeological findings about what we have, Etoile and the Fosse Alambi area, these are creations of the French mandate. So we have 50 years of townscapes in front of us. And this, this is very important because for the past 10 years we were talking about the memory of the city. And most of the time, we did not have enough historical research to qualify what do we mean exactly by the history of the city. And uh, during the pre-war period, nobody cared about the history of Beirut during the late Ottoman and French mandate period. It's only the war reconstruction for the past 20 years that's now producing a new breed of historians who for the first time are trying to study the historical evolution, the recent historical evolution of the city, and accordingly they are helping us to assess what do we mean really by the issue of heritage. So, and I would like here to point out to, to, to a particular point. If we take, for instance, Cairo or Aleppo or Damascus, now they did not, at this particular point, th they are not facing yet the issue of colonial architecture. And is it worth preserving or not? And I would like to say here that one of the richest cities, uh, when we are talking about colonial architecture, one of the richest cities are actually Cairo. Uh, Beirut always referred to Cairo as an example and also referred to Istanbul. Okay? So, uh, now we have a big problem. Actually, we may say that we are the first to face this particular issue of preserving or accepting for ourselves the, uh, uh, the issue of colonial heritage because now the same heritage in Cairo is now in danger of, of, of disappearing. Okay? So at least uh, uh, I think that uh, this, this particular reconstruction process has brought up this uh, revision of, of what we mean by, uh, by, by uh, heritage. Because heritage is not a fixed notion. It's always an evolving notion that you have to take care of. Okay. So, we can... Uh, please bear with me, uh, you know, pictures will come back, you know, just I'll have to follow a particular logic. 
So the first, the first level that, that we, you know, if you want to, to define what we want to preserve from Beirut is the issue of history. But the second level is, is what we call the informal level. It means that the memory of the city, uh, how people remember the city, it's not here, we are not no more talking about historians, we are talking about people, about people from different age groups, how did, rem did they remember the city? And here also, a lot of abuse was done in the discourse of the reconstruction. Because we found out that architects, urban planners, and the opposition, most of the time, they referred to the memory of the city, and sociologists too, for the past 10 years, without, without doing their homework. Actually, what they meant by the memory of the city, they never asked what the public, what really the people thought was, the memory of the city, how they remember it. And uh, actually what we did, we, uh, in 1990, uh, we, we did an exercise at the American University of Beirut. We decided to interview uh, 80, uh, uh, 80 persons, and uh, we asked them to draw their mental maps of the city. It was directly before uh, the city opened up to, to people, okay? So, uh, and what we tried to do, uh, we tried to segregate them into different age groups. And uh, through their mental maps, and through a particular questionnaire, we tried to investigate what really the memory of the city meant for people. And here I will go very fast, I will expose a little bit the results that we got. And I will tell you, seven years later, what they discovered in terms when, when they asked the people also what part of the city should be preserved. Okay. Uh. So we started with, with a, a tabular rasa. And the first age group, actually, the way they perceived the city was like this. For them, it was an empty sheet, actually, with only two uh, major features, uh, Place de Martin and uh, uh, Masal Street. Why? Uh, most of the time in their, uh, in their uh, drawings, Place de Martin was, since they were drawing it, they never saw uh, the people, I mean, my students were under the age of 25. They never saw really the city before, uh, you know, before the war. So their memory of the city, they got it out from television, from media, and from the accounts of their parents. And for this reason, Place de Martyr always came in their, uh, in their uh, uh, maps. In this, and Place de l'Etoile, but the way that they drew Place I don't, I, I won't go through the process, but the way they drew Place de l'Etoile and Place des Martyrs was actually wrong. Because some of them drew Place des Martyrs as a circle, okay, and Place de l'Etoile as a square. And why do we have Street Armacer? Because this is the only street that was not destroyed during the war, and it was, it was still accessible in 1983. So some of them were able to access this particular street. Now, for, for the age group, which, uh, uh, between 25 and 45, we see that, that the image of the city has densified, okay, over here. And well, we found out that people in this, in the age group between 25 and 35, then 35 and 45, they shared, uh, people between 25 and 35, they were afraid that the city will be reconstructed because they already built their businesses outside the city during the war and they were afraid if, if the central business industry will be reactivated what will happen to them. And, uh, but they had a clearer image of the city. Uh, we, uh, then the people between, uh, between 35 and 45, they were the romantics. Okay? These were the people that invested a large part of their memory. Uh, and I was in this group at that particular period. And they invest a large part of, the, of their memory in, in the central business district. And for them, the central district should be uh, reconstructed as it used to. Uh, 
Uh, but the, uh, then we have, of course, the age uh, above for, uh, 45. Okay, uh, they had a very clear, uh, you know, memory of the city. Here we segregate it into, into important elements. However, we ask them questions, for instance, would you like the city to be reconstructed or not? And uh, here we, uh, we started having in, uh, different answers because the age group which was under 25, they said, let's rebuild the city completely new. Because they did not care, uh, they absolutely did not care to reconstruct the city as it used to be. Okay? So uh, when they, uh, we went in, we were the first to go in the city, when the city opened. And I asked them actually to write their first impression when they went into the city. We got a special, you know, after this exercise. But I have a article on that, you know, I will leave it for reading. I won't elaborate on that. But the age between 25 and, 40 and 35, they were rather reluctant. They did not know, they did not express a real uh, interest or not. They were subdivided into two groups. The age between 20, uh, 25 and 45, they were the romantics. We want the city as it used to be. And the people above 45, a large percentage of them told us that we would like the city to be rebuilt. Why? Because in order to provide work opportunities for our children. <laughs> so they, they put their personal uh, uh, memories on the side and in order to think about future economic opportunities about, about uh, the children. And here we started for the first time uh, we, we refuse to generalize. And architects and planners, sociologists and politicians tend to generalize. They tend to say that let's rebuild the city or let's not rebuild the city. They use the term memory, you know, the one they want, uh, the, the way they want it. And here we start to qualify that people did not think about rebuilding the city in the same way. They thought about it differently. And uh, we did actually at the end a synthesis map, which we call the, the image of the city. And here we, are, we start in, in uh, you know, based on this particular table, how many times, you know, each feature was repeated. And Matisse's quest came first, actually. And, uh, but for the wrong reason, I'll tell you why later on. So, uh, so we, uh, we, and after that we superimposed, okay, uh, the, um, uh, okay, the historical layers. I mean, it's, it was a long exercise. Its purpose actually was to superpose the historical layers, the memory, the, the conceptual structure of the city in order to reach an urban design framework, not a scheme, an urban design framework through which we can test all the reconstruction plans that were presented. And actually, we tested two reconstruction plans, the one which was done in 1977, and the one that was done by Ibdi in 1990. And the first resisted very well to our test. The second did not. So, uh, however, uh, now, seven years later, uh, a German scholar, uh, Heiko Schmidt, in the Orient Institute in Beirut, did another uh, survey. You know, he asked uh, if they want the city to be reconstructed, what do they think about Solidaire, about the reconstruction of this city? And, but before that, he did an interesting map. Uh, no. Next. Yeah. He did an interesting map, and he studied on this map uh, what is the amount of destruction that was done during the war and after the war. And uh, here what you have, in black, what, what's preserved. What was destroyed during the war, actually, is you see it in yellow. And what was destroyed before the construction, after the war, you see it in blue. So, when people said that the city was wiped out after the war more than it used to be before the war, he verified it through comparing aerial views and with the Okay. According to him, 20 25% of the city remained, and around 70 to 80% were raised after the war, not during the war. Okay. This has political connotation that we, want to go, uh, we do not want to go into. 
but I mean, this this uh, this was the uh, I mean uh, the map that he uh, tried to study. The second uh, uh, part of his uh, of his uh, survey, he he actually surveyed 200 interviewees, Muslims and Christians, half half, and he. Uh, uh, and I will read his uh, his uh, result, the, the results about uh, okay uh, what he said. Uh, more than two thirds of the interviewees spontaneously, completely, or uh, predominantly, I mean this is his work, agreed with the planning of, and, and the reconstruction of the central business. And here the percentage he, uh, he put to around 75%. So 75% of, but the level of acceptance uh, in, in, you know, in, the, in the Muslim community was higher than, a little bit higher than the level of acceptance in the Christian community. Due to the principle probably of, of, of Hariri at that particular point. But both of them, they expressed a, uh, you know, a positive reaction to the rebuilding of the city. And here again, seven years later, we saw that there is a gap between what architects and planners say, what uh, uh, you know, uh, politicians say, and what actually people think about reconstruction. So, this is the second part, actually. This is the second question that will help us define what to preserve in the city. So, the first part was, historically speaking, what should we preserve from the city? And the second part, if we take the memory of people themselves, what should we preserve from the city? And actually, the, the current you know, reconstruction plan does not respond uh, to both. But it's not here a value judgment. Uh, this, this particular issue has to be further rediscussed in order to, to see the grace of the matter. The issue is not a black and white uh, uh, discourse like it was happening during the past 10 years. It needs more uh, elaboration in order to reach a more balanced view of, of, uh, of the policy that has been followed, uh, followed up now. And, um, I would like just to mention one, uh, one particular thing is that uh, when, we, uh, when he asked people about the Maltese Square, if they want to preserve it or not, they said they did not really care to preserve it. Okay. Uh, what, what he said actually, uh, it's not exactly he, uh, because the controversy was that if the Maltese Square should, should continue, you know, should form a, a visual corridor under the sea. And they said they don't mind. And when we, came, we went back to the uh, historical uh, uh, planning, we found out that the French actually, uh, please, Max. Uh, okay, here we see, sorry, here we see Beirut uh, around, uh, it's uh, 1991, next. Here we see Beirut 1995, and you see that there is a bigger amount of destruction that was done after the war than at, uh, you know, at the beginning of the war. Uh, just, you know, next, please. Okay, uh, so here it's uh, the plan. Please, next. No, just go back. No, back. I think there's something wrong here. Uh, the link of the slide. My God, I mean, okay. So, uh, what, what, uh, actually what happened is that already the French recommended that the Place des Martyrs uh, continues, I mean, uh, in one visual corridor toward the sea. And that particular point, uh, uh, the, the work resisted this, this particular, uh, you know, decision, and they did the Rivoli building. Okay, so it was, it was not a, it, uh, you know, historically speaking, it was not a decision uh, that, uh, you know, a, a public decision to, to stop the, the uh, Martin Square to have it the same way as we used to have it before. It was just a contingency that happened at a particular time in history. So, the, again, the issue of opening up the Martin Square to the sea, uh, it's uh, historically valid. And for people themselves, it's, uh, they don't, I mean, uh, 
for them, it's, uh, it, it provides an open space for the city and a view towards the sea. And I would like to tell you that uh, the way I'm, I'm talking to you now, two or three years ago, uh, I did not have the same arguments at all. Okay? Uh, and with time, the more we read and the more we learn about the history of the city, the more that we uh, you know, care to ask people what they think, we start to form a, you know, uh, a, balanced, a more balanced opinion about, what's, uh, about the reconstruction itself. For this reason, in my introduction, I told you that Beirut 2000, the controversy is gone. Something else is happening. Now, it's, it's a period of realism that's, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's being, uh, you know, we are going through a period of realism. But we are trying to assess what we have, if it accompli. And therefore, we, we are trying to, you know, to study history, we are trying to, to communicate in order to, to see how far this particular project is acceptable or not. So, we are beyond the, the, the period of the, you know, the, the mid-1990s where everybody saw things in the black and white. And, you know, when, when I said to you, the construction, the construction, 2000 I think the, the most important change that happened in Beirut 2000 is this more balanced view about things the way that they are before. Okay. Now, uh, so, if we want, uh, if we equate memory of the city to two, uh, uh, to two points, okay, the urban fabric and buildings. Okay, if we, uh, sorry, I lost the, the uh, I mean, uh, the arguments because I think I have a problem with, with the opening of, of the slide. But uh, I'll come back here. Okay, uh, if you are talking about preservation, we can equate, you know, uh, preservation with two variables. The first variable is preserving the urban fabric of the city, meaning the street pattern and the, uh, the uh, parcels themselves and the building. The second part of the equation is to preserve the buildings themselves. Okay, so let's see uh, what we have now in terms of, of preservation. What happened? So, what you see here in red, in this particular part, is the French mandate part. Okay, that was preserved as it is. Okay, both in terms of the urban fabric and the buildings themselves. Okay, now. Uh, the two other parts that were preserved as an urban fabric, we have the two residential parts. We have the Saifi area, and then we have the Wadi Abujmin area. Those parts were preserved in terms of the streets, but the, the parcellation itself and the reconstruction of this area is, has been revised completely. So, and the rest of the city, we have part of the city which, uh, which has been completely, uh, the new part of the city, which has, which has been completely uh, redesigned. So, uh, we may say, for instance, that uh, we have here, uh, like 20% of the central business was preserved in terms of urban fabric, uh, and uh, buildings and lots, and probably around the other 40% which was preserved only in terms of an urban fabric, but without the lots and the buildings. Uh, okay, now if we, uh, I would like to, uh, to show a particular example of, you know, a particular problem when we are dealing with the issue of preserving the urban fabric. And uh, uh, what we have over here is, if we subdivide the dialects of conservation in three categories. First, we have the problem between above and versus below, then inside versus outside, then existing versus the potential. When we take above versus below, we are talking about urban archaeology versus underground parking. Okay, so we have a problem in the city. If you want to preserve urban archaeology, but you want to have parking, 
You have this, two, uh, you know, this problem between above and below. Then you have the problem between inside and outside. Okay, you want to preserve the walls of the city, uh, the frontage, the facade of the city, but also you have a problem. You cannot, maybe you have to reshape the buildings from within to a new usage. So you cannot just leave them as buildings of, you know, at the beginning of the, of, the, of the 20th century. So we have also this problem between the inside and outside. The third part is the problem between, uh, okay, the existing and the potential. And here, this problem is mostly expressed in terms of verticality. And uh, if we take, for instance, the, the existing zoning, Okay, and we take the, the existing development, the difference in between, most of the time is expressed in terms, of vertical, uh, in terms of vertical extension. How this vertical extension is being dealt with, this is also another problem of, of conservation. So, uh, how, uh, how did Solidaire dealt with this, uh, with this particular problem? I will, uh, uh, I will give you here just a uh, table. Is, uh, So, uh, the solutions that were given to this particular problem, we may subdivide them as follows. We have preserved, uh, uh, we start with preserved building, infant is wrong here. the last thing. So we have preserved building, meaning buildings are preserved from outside and inside as they are, and you have the same usage. Okay. The second point is modernized heritage buildings, which means that you have the same buildings preserved from outside, but they are modernized from within. Okay. The second, you have make-believe townscape buildings. And this category, where you have only the facade which is being kept, and buildings are being destroyed from inside. Okay. And they are completely rebuilt. And it's not something that has been done only in Solidarity. It has been done with, with the American University of Beirut. Okay. So it's uh, when uh, you preserve the, the outside of the building and you rebuild it according to, to, uh, to a new um, uh, plan. Exactly. You have the neo-traditional building. And the two last uh, uh, categories here, you have the infill buildings, meaning that when, when you want to preserve the urban fabric and you have infill, uh, infills to do, you have two solutions. Or you, you can create a neo-traditional building or you can create a contemporary building, okay? But within the same framework of urban design. So all these solutions actually were adopted in Solidaire and they were adopted outside Solidaire. But what's interesting here is that, uh, okay, I'll talk, I'll talk about this later, okay? I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you a first example, okay? This is the Saifi area. Okay. And what we have over here, a neo-traditional infill architecture. And what's interesting here is, is that what you, it's, it's actually a pastiche architecture. Okay. And uh, in order to have the same symmetry in the elevations, sometimes they have problems in terms of plans. You know that the traditional house, the traditional Lebanese house, used to be a central wall, okay, with rooms on both sides. In order to have the symmetry here, they end up with ritual spaces over here just to keep the facade as it is. So there is a contradiction actually between the elevations and, and uh, uh, this is part of what we call it's the, the uh, neo-traditional or pastiche architecture. Okay, uh, this is another solution. Okay, and here this is what we call make-believe architecture. And, and here it's, it's very interesting. We have buildings in Solidaire which are completely wiped, at, wiped, wiped out from within. They just leave the, the envelope of the building. They reinforce it uh, completely. And they rebuild the, another, you know, the inside. Uh, completely new. And this is in, in this particular category, this is a picture that was taken uh, last year in, uh, in Solidaire. Yeah. Uh, okay. Fine. Here we have a, 
an interesting example. And here we have, uh, you know, the, the uh, modernized traditional film. And of course we have the Grand Serai. And what they did, actually, they added one floor. Okay. Uh, they completely destroyed the building from inside. They left the elevation from outside. And they added dormers and to, uh, to the red tile. So, what can we say about this type of preservation? Okay. If we want to go back, this is an institutional building. This is a government building. It was always a government building. The original character was actually a, 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 an Ottoman, an Ottoman building, which was supposed to, to have a certain character. Uh, here, which was completely reshuffled, okay, which was completely redone, but uh, uh, and uh, new elements of styles were introduced. So, if we want to talk about the original character of a building, it is lost. But there's a certain image which is left. We are actually, we are left with the image of the building. Only. We are, uh, we, it's like a reminder of the building. We are not left with the building itself. But, again, this is not criticism. It has been done, not only in Beirut, it has been done, you know, uh, now it's being done, you know, a, a lot uh, outside, I mean, both in Europe and uh, in other countries in the region. But this is also just an example of what you can do in terms of preservation. Another, uh, another example is, so uh, Tawili area. And here it expressed the duality between above and, and below, okay? Uh, they need a parking, you know, a large parking. And uh, the Sukh Tawili became now, the new program Sukh Tawili, is actually a, a, a modern move, okay? But uh, what has been done, they preserved what we call the skin deep historicism, meaning that they preserved the street pattern Okay, but actually it's on a uh, it's on a parking. It's no more on, on archaeological remains, and they rebuilt a new project. Please, uh, no next. Okay, so these are the new souks. Okay, which are actually they are not souks anymore. They are it's a new way of dealing with the issues of, of commercial space in the city. So we may say that here we have skin deep historicism. I mean, this is something, uh, just um, I'm trying to show examples. Uh, next, please. OK. Here is another example, the Kosh Alambi area, the Etwal area. Buildings, they were preserved as they, as they are from the outside. But from the inside, they were modernized. Next. Okay, here we have the uh, Fosh Street, and we have here different examples. We have, for instance, this building which were preserved from outside, but modernized uh, from inside, okay. We have also the mosque which was preserved as it is from outside and inside, okay, next. Here we have the municipality which was preserved from outside as inside and inside as it is. Here we have the other buildings which were preserved as uh, from outside. And actually we have another example of an infant building, okay, which is a new one. But which is following actually the same, the same lines uh, in terms of uh, the street rules. Uh, I would like to... Uh, I would like to conclude with uh, with the following. The range of responses that we saw in terms of dealing with heritage was different problems. The first, uh, I would like to add here that uh, we have also, uh, I mean, we don't have enough time, but another a very interesting uh, really, you know, uh, issue to deal with is how preservation was carried on inside Solidar and outside Solidar. 
And here I'd like to tell you that inside Solidar, it was carried systematically. Implementation of conservation was done with a very high standards. Outside Solidar, because we have another planning system, it, it's being done haphazardly. But this is something that has to deal with the planning approach, and we'll be discussing it tomorrow in terms of the difference of approaches to conservation, because implementation is also a part of this particular problem of conservation. How can we implement it? I would like to say that, that the experience of reconstruction was extremely rich, although controversial and very difficult. It was a very rich experience because for the past 10 years, we were obliged to revise our history. We were obliged to fight so therefore to come up with new conclusions. And also, it helped us look within ourselves and expand our perspective. These are not empty words. These are, these are I mean, uh, when, when you follow up on this discourse for the past 10 or 15 years, you, you feel that you have evolved in terms of thinking about reconstruction. We don't believe now anymore in just people saying that, okay, pro or against Solidar, pro or against all, I mean, the, the, the controversy went beyond this, this particular point. Now we are dealing with, not we, we are dealing, as I said, with the problem with a more balanced view. We are trying to, to revise our positions. And uh, I uh, just I would like to read this as a conclusion. Uh, uh, and here I'll, I'll mention Barman Landour, the, uh, the, the colleague of mine, the American University of Uh Barman Landour, the investigation of traditional contemporary buildings, remarks that architectural discourse of post colonial societies is predominantly attempting different ways of interpreting or identifying the authentic local identity by positioning traditional buildings and its images as uh, the principal uh, narrators of that identity. He denounced the futility of such attempts and continues, history is constructed as two opposite poles, pre and post modernization with a break that is usually attributed to ambiguous forces of modernization and colonization. I may add, to simplify the argument, that for the, uh, for the first time, we are incorporating the colonial in our national heritage, but we are still refusing to accept it as part of our own identity, our own internal makeup, both personal and national. And this may be the heart of the matter. Uh, what I'm trying to say here that we have to accept ourselves. We, do, we cannot anymore uh, define maybe our identity in terms of pre-modernization tra or traditional architecture. Maybe we have to accept ourselves as as hybrid personalities, which with uh, uh, or or uh, you know with uh, with the uh, um, we have to accept ourselves as hybrid. But we have to include the colonial heritage as part of our identity. And maybe this is what the most important uh, change that's happening now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to, uh, to recuperate your building. 
And however, you have a time frame <coughs> to conform to and particular standards in terms of preservation. For instance, if you take two or three years and you don't finish your building and you don't do it to a particular standard, okay, you're not allowed to, uh, to recuperate your building. After the war, people didn't have money, so they cannot, uh, they cannot catch up with this uh, schedule. There was a schedule. So, so what happened? They lose the, their rights yeah. to have their own buildings and their own homes. And who benefits from this? And what would the Lebanese die or the owner in this case? It was not so. This is still a controversy, okay? Uh, which, which was raised at, at the start of, you know, this, uh, of the... Of, uh, you know, of the, of the reconstruction. Uh, and, uh, however, you know, there's, there's now a uh, argument that writes about this particular uh, issue. They say you have two choices. Or you leave the choice for people, for instance, to do, uh, or to uh, just uh, to, uh, to do the preservation that, uh, that they want, with the time frame that they want, like it's happening sometimes outside the city. But, it has a main disadvantage is you have corporate planning inside the city. You have one particular company which is trying to, it's a real estate company. Uh, so what they are trying to do, they are trying to meet a schedule and to finish at this particular schedule and not to start marketing the, you know, the area. So uh, the, um, for instance, as I told you, outside the uh, Solidar area, uh, things are not moving here. Because you have this particular uh, way of dealing with the problem, okay, leaving people uh, to people the choice in terms of time frame, in terms of standards to do what they want to do. Inside Solidarity, it moved so fast because they imposed this particular time frame and these particular standards. This is what I can tell you. It's, you know. I mean, who got was there an agreement that they give a certain percentage of the houses or place to the, to the previous owner? And that's, that's, that's owned by whom now? Yeah. You so see, there's yeah, there's two types of shares. Uh, you know, uh, the first type is A for for previous owners, and the type B is for 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 the new investors. These are the two types of shares that you have. Who are the new investors? Who did that now? Ah, this, uh, this is, uh, we are opening, uh, you know, that's our, no, I, you know, I, I had, I had the, you know, I thought a lot before this presentation, you know, I said to myself, I can deal with this problem from two different perspectives, okay, just bring forward all the question marks, okay, beforehand, and answer them. You know, what I did actually, something that is not taken in this, uh, you know, uh, presentation. Before coming here, I asked five people about the different questions. You know, controversial questions, but especially how do they see Solidar in, you know, uh, the next 10 years? This is what I wanted to know, okay? Uh, I asked an economist, for instance, I did sociologist, uh, people who, uh, who had always, you know, the, tendency to think about, uh, and I said, I solidarity, but I said also outside solidarity. I mean, what, what do they think will happen, okay, for the next 10 years? What do they think about this particular issue? People are, don't have enough time to follow a particular schedule, to follow particular standards, okay? What you have now is you have arguments, you know, on both sides, and, uh, uh, you know, it depends actually on your particular perspective. You may go from one side or, or the other. The issue here is boils down to one particular point. If you have, a, you, you know, if you rely on the government as, or, you know, it's the public sector initiative or the private sector initiative, okay? It's, it boils down to, to this, uh, you know, it's the welfare uh, state versus the, the you know, corporate form. And uh, you see, I tried to, to think about this particular issue. There's other examples than, than Beirut, okay. Uh, Beirut was done based on, on other uh, models, for instance, uh, I love dogs. I mean, other, uh, you have also the different places which were reconstructed and based on 
big, a big development, so which is at the same time, at the same place. And you have different models, okay? And these models are evolving. Dial of Ducks, they thought for instance, three years ago that it's, it's, uh, the, the, it's stopped, it's finished. And the building now, uh, and, and the, you know, the area is going back. So there are a lot, you know, a lot of criticism that because of saturation, uh, the project failed. I did not fail, actually. It's, it's now, it's, it's uh, I think, uh, it's going on. Whereby La Défense, it was also another approach whereby the government uh, uh, got the infrastructure going, they brought in their own, you know, public institutions in order to start a development process. So it was like a joint venture, like always in France, between the, the central government and the private sector. So both models, and, and actually in Beirut, and I'll be talking tomorrow about this particular issue, we have the two models. The other model, which is very interesting, actually, is Elisa, which is the, the, the uh, southern suburbs. And here negotiations happened between the government and Hezbollah. And what we have now uh, is, is a joint venture. We don't have a, a private, just, you know, uh, a corporate approach to, uh, to development. So we have both, we are experiencing, it's very interesting, we are experiencing different types of, of, of planning inside and outside. And I may say maybe the center needs a certain particular approach. Each part of the city needs, I think, a different approach. We cannot apply the same planning approach, the same logic to, to, to the different sectors of the city. We are learning, you see, to be less opinionated. You know, uh, the devil's advocate. I need to, uh, uh, you see, this 15, I mean, 10 years of reconstruction, you know, you, end up, you don't see things anymore uh, just like this. You, you evolve. Five years ago, we tend to see it that way. Black and white, this is, this is right, this is wrong. You know, uh, just throw some care, or you know, drink, you know, something like that. So now it's, it's different, it's, it's evolving. Uh, sorry, c c will it be possible for you to el elaborate on the process uh, by which the master plan was arrived at? Yeah, it was it was arrived at in three stages. <coughs> okay, today I did not, uh, you know, tomorrow I'm talking about. It started the first day started 1977. Okay, the first master plan of the central business district was done in 1977, two years after uh, the war started. And we had a totally different approach to, to, to the master plan. Okay. Then, in 1983, the new plan was initiated because another plan was, was commissioned to, to that already in 1983. Okay. And uh, so, in 1991, uh, we had the plan by Dar al and uh, there was a big difference between 1977 and 1991, where in 1977 you had a very careful approach to conservation. Because the city was not destroyed at that point. Okay? The city was still there. So they did not need actually one corporate entity to take care of the city. So that means that the lot of you know, parts. Actually, they subdivided the city in different parts. Parts were done by individual owners, and the other parts were done actually by small real estate companies. Okay? It was subdivided like this. Due to the destruction they came out before or after the war, okay, the choice of one, uh, you know, uh, one entity, one real estate company, uh, became something which you know, started to be advanced. And what happened, the 1991 plan was harshly criticized by the opposition. Okay. And Solidar had the intelligence at that point, between 90, I mean, later on, to take into consideration what the opposition said, okay, and to modify the 1991 plan. And, you know, it's too bad I did not explain it today, but. A, you know, what, what they tried to reach actually, and this is, you know, a part of their, uh, you know, way of dealing, test way of dealing with the problem is, they always measured what the opposition was saying 
and what is the financial impact <coughs> on, on uh, the modification. And they try always to reach a compromise. The most intelligent people in this process were not the architects of the design, the uh, urban design. They were actually the, the uh, managers there. Okay, <coughs> this, the managers. Okay, the, the managers of the projects themselves. <laughs> who are business oriented, who at the same time, who uh, they did not issue, for instance, black and white uh, uh, judgments. They were trying always to get the opposition on their side. It, and uh, also in the same time, the plan was modified actually uh, uh, through this this uh, negotiation. So we learned between 1992 and 1995-96 that uh, you know opposition works sometimes. Okay. There was some, but at a certain point, to a certain level. Does that answer you? Thank you. It is really good. I mean, it is. There is a personality there that we should have. I have no idea. So, you said that the team yeah. yeah, so if you read the seven halves, you know, around this particular period of time, and you read an half in the 1990s, and you try to make the comparison, it's fascinating, you find a lot of people are doing this, yeah, people are documenting this. Yeah, for instance, the, the, issue, the, the issue of modernization, the reaction towards modernization, it's, it's, for instance, always how do we look towards new models, to, in order to fit within the, the uh, uh, international market. Uh, the same arguments were advanced by people then and by people now. Okay, this future is no towards, uh, you know, towards reconstruction. Uh, and the controversy also about preservation. They reacted against wiping out part of the city then and 100 years later. And it is documented, it's documented in, in articles, you know. An article here. And also they raised, it's, it's fascinating, they raised the issue of the real estate joint venture in 1900 for implementation. There is an article. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's the, uh, because actually this, I mean, between uh, modernized, uh, the same uh, mechanisms were, were used that, you know, they, okay, they evolved that, the same approach was was uh, was done by by the main by the French. Uh, in your uh, study that you carried out, uh, directly after the war, uh, it seems that at least to you, uh, uh, not doing anything about about the reconstruction or just uh, letting people do it was not a bad choice. Uh, what, what, ah, to, to me, yeah, but yeah, where's in my heart? Yeah, yeah. yeah, what did I say? You didn't mention it in the, in the study. Like, it, it, there was always, uh, uh, how do we do the reconstruction? And, and not whether we do it or not. And, uh, what do you, you want to know my personal opinion? Yours, and, and uh, what do you think uh, would have been the results if such a, a choice was valid? <coughs> Let me tell you. I, Okay. <laughs> Let's suppose, you know, we have a bankruptcy now. <coughs> the Central Business District project. First way bankruptcy. So, you know, what will happen? What's the worst that can happen? People will just go in and rebuild. But like, does there have to be, be in this case? Yeah. Does there have to be a master plan? That's that's the question. The, the issue is not, you know, it's, it's at what level the level of flexibility that you'll have to reach in terms of directing. I mean.
The issue of master planning is an issue of, you know, it turns around one particular point, flexibility. Okay. This is, the, this is the most difficult of the whole issue. How flexible you can get, and, uh, you know, th this is the point. How flexible you can get with the, with the, with the private sector uh, in terms of, master planning is about flexibility. What about uh, people? Did they, did they really want to... Flexibility with people. No, I mean, I mean uh, what was uh, the perception of, of uh, what needed to be done? Uh, I told you, I told you that we did two... Uh, at, at that time? <coughs> at, at the start, at the, at 1990? Yeah. yeah. I told you different age groups, they responded differently. No, I mean like uh, choosing whether we should do the reconstruction or not. I refuse to generalize. We used to generalize, you know, ask architects, they will generalize, they will tell you we should reconstruct as it is, or we should not. No, I refuse to generalize. We learned in 10 years that we cannot generalize. So I don't, I, I won't answer your question. Because people, you know, people think differently. I mean, and, uh, in terms of their interest, in terms of their age, we cannot reach a consensus. We can reach a majority, but we cannot reach a consensus. And the majority is for the construction, actually. Yeah, yeah, of course, because it learned also to negotiate. Okay, between 1991 and 1995, they negotiated. They were obliged to do it. And they went through, you know, they did it very intelligently. Uh, how would you characterize? Uh, how would you characterize or describe the match or mismatch uh, between the physical planning and the socio-political plan? In other words, does the physical planning play a role in enhancing or deterring the the uh, structuring of either fragmentation of society or building some sort of social cohesion? Yeah, let me tell you. For us, there, there's something which is, you know, which, which was raised about the central business district. They said that it will, it will just create segregation within the city. It will make a center for for a global market, and that you know, it will just segregate between the center and, and you know the periphery. And uh, one of the arguments is, is as follows: that you know, 90% of the people who will be working in downtown, they are secretary. You know, they, they, not all of them are just heads of, so, you, you know, they, they are so, ordinary people, I mean, from all walks of life. Uh, the city cannot just, you know, uh, uh, survive on, on, you know, just, you know, corporate heads. You know, a lot of people will have to work within the central business district and business will be created for them, okay? So, accordingly, this, this issue of segregation between you know that that the project will create segregation between the center and the periphery. I'm not very sure about that, especially there's something else which is happening now, very interesting. You know, they, they are uh, completing the waterfront, okay, the promenade, and now people are starting to penetrate Solidaire from the waterfront. I don't know if you know Beirut. You have the promenade which comes to the Saint George. Okay, from the Rauschi, and people now are starting to penetrate and start solely there through, through, through the waterfront. They are invading it. Why? Because it's the only open space in the city. I mean, we have the Corniche, we have Sadaria, and that's it. Okay, we have the Gulf Club, which is private, by the way. Okay, so what we have is only the waterfront. And if Solidaire once it or not, people will invade the waterfront because it's, it's actually it's a wonderful place. I mean, they are doing very beautiful project there, and you know when the promenade will continue, it will be just a beautiful place. I mean, it will be better than probably uh, what what the Corniche is now, uh, etc. So, okay, uh, sorry, it's an argument for solitaire. But I mean, I mean so uh, there's something else also. It's, uh, two years ago, we won't say this. Okay. We'll just refuse the logic of the logic. Okay, we'll refuse it. 
But there's something else also. People now are starting to, for instance, they are creating fairs in, in the conservation area, first and then the you know, French, uh, French mandate area. And people are very happy to go there. Uh, so but they, they are happy to go there. I mean, it's a part of the city. They are trying to, they are taking over the city. I think that people at the end, they are more powerful than corporations. Whoever corporations are, people are more powerful. And I think at the end they will, you know, they will take the city. They will take the center. But the and, cross, the and the process started that. And does the flying cross include the public domain to preserve public domain for the people? For the you never know. You, see, power. you know, for instance, that okay, you have the highest percentage of the spaces in Beirut in the center, which is not existing before. Okay? You have it now. In terms of accessibility to the public, which part is accessible, which part is not, it's another story. But you cannot stop people from accessing now, a lot of people go to this just to walk, to jog, I mean, to meet there. Because the only thing, this is why I started my presentation by saying, for instance, that we are beyond the controversy. We are recuperating the center because Beirut outside of the center is a chaotic city. It's a very unpleasant city to live in. I'm sorry, you know, to say about Beirut. Uh, you know, to states ago, but it's it's very it's, it's a very crowded city. It's uh, it's getting more and more polluted. It's uh, you know, it's not an easy city to live in. And the class, uh, within the central business district, how much has been the change in proportion between uh, dwellings and business offices? Yeah, uh, I don't have the percentage now. Right. Yeah, but uh, you see, I showed you uh, two areas. I, I may say, for instance, forty percent of of the area uh, may be residential, but I'm not. Forty uh, percent will be. Well, this is the is being developed to be a residential. Okay, middle income. Now they say that most of the time, also another, uh, you know, it's about segregation. They say that the only people that could live in downtown are the upper class, because prices are are very expensive. Okay, this is this is the people who could afford to live in. Cyclic area and to live in. But also, you can say, for instance, people who live in Verdun also. I mean, they are the same. <laughs> so, Verdun is another. A city is a mosaic, actually. You see. Uh, and you never know. I mean, it depends on, on how the economics evolve. If, if Solidar has to compete later on for the for the residential market, they will have to lower their prices. Accordingly, uh, the residential area will be more accessible. It's it's uh, uh, again uh, it's uh, more and more. It's being proved that Solidar is not an island. Cannot be an island. It cannot be. Okay, the city will take it over if Solidar wants it or not. The city will take it over. You know, it's center. So in this case, it's. My question was related to the normal process that we are living also in Europe. The, in the last 20 years, there was a process of uh, becoming the center of the cities, the service center, everything yeah. of the central world. business system. Now we are uh, living a different change, let's say. Now uh, there is a process of rehabilitation of dwellings, but a normal segregation because of uh, uh, money is living. It's making the center is back in the hands of wealthy people. Berlin. Now, you are uh, talking about Berlin? No, I'm talking, for instance, I know better my, my country's Spain. Ah. Uh, and now, the, the, the only choice to contract or to balance this is, let's say, the, the, the municipality or the public sector to try to include within this major development uh, departments or uh, 20% 20, 20 for lower income so and are developed by, by the government. Some, mm -hmm. Something similar has been done or is planned to be done in no. the central. And don't, don't you think that this will, let's say, create a more balanced and more unbalanced uh, center for people? Yeah, there will be a lot of people working there in, yeah. during the day, but they will flee to the dormitory cities outside. No, you see, the territory. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer as follows. Beirut, uh, you know, if we see uh, for the past 100 years, Beirut, 
It has evolved from a, a prime center, a very modern center of the French mandate, and it decayed in the 60s and 70s. Why? Because other centers were created, and people moved out. Actually, always, uh, rest, uh, the first people to move out are, are, you know, people who are residing within the city and who have the means to, to, to move out, they move out because the more the city turns into a, a, a business district, the more it's less suitable for people to live there. So the cycle happened for, for the year. Now, uh, of course, it's always uh, better to have you see a balanced profile, a balanced social profile within the city. Uh, I tend, uh, I tend to see that that you know um, the modern city tend to be segregated in terms of income more and more. I've seen this example in the U.S., in Europe, and why should I refuse it in, in the Middle East? Actually, the Middle Eastern city is the most, you know, if we compare it to, to the Western cities, we still have, for instance, mixed neighborhoods terms of income, but uh, we are more and more evolving towards homogeneous neighborhoods, both in terms of income and in terms of religious affiliation. Except, except in the case of Beirut, for instance, it's not happening in two areas. Mixed, actually, you see, always, just you know, to finish on, on this particular point, Problems of mixture never existed with the higher income bracket. People had no problems to live together, to, to mix together. Okay? It existed uh, always on the lower income level and on the, the, the middle income. Okay? So if you look at upper class neighborhoods in the city, they tend always to be maybe less homogeneous than lower income neighborhoods or middle income. And I'm sorry, I'm talking very realistically about what, you know, how, how I see the city. So to build a social mixture, uh, artificial social mixture in America did not work, by the way, through my experience in Los Angeles. You know, always we try to provide for 20% for low income through, you know, uh, corporate. Uh, and it never works. It's very, it's working in Spain. It is working. Well, I, I guess it depends on the, urban culture and, and the way the cities are created and, and the new e-commerce for instance, probably in, in Los Angeles there's a problem of new commerce. Yes. And the, yeah, the situation is different is probably in Europe. That's it's not different. That's because they, they, they bear a common culture probably. That's like the river. So I'm Sophia. شكرا <تصفيق> 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 